I gave this talk the first time in Brazil, I think around 2011. Uh, it was kind of a focused general high level uh, talk. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't really know the uh, exact technical level of everyone here, or how, if it's a mixture, if it's, you know, some people got, I'm sure we have some kernel developers here, some driver writers here, and some people at a, or more higher level, user space level, I'm assuming, correct, maybe. So this talk is mostly going to be more at a higher level. The next one I'll get more into the, uh, the nitty gritty of things. Um, still a little jet lagged. I didn't get any sleep while I was here, and I started with a cold. Uh, before I came here, and I found out that jet lag and beer don't make a cold better. So <clears throat> I'm stuffy and a little hoarse. But anyway, the topic is you know real time Linux. You know who needs it? Not you. Um, it's a really good marketing campaign. I work for Red Hat. I'm on the real time team. We sell a real time product. So my marketing is you don't need our product. Um, actually, I've told that to customers, and I got mad at them when they tried using it. And they said, this isn't doing what I wanted to do. I'm like, you're right. It's not because you're using the wrong tool. So go away. Find someone else to uh, torture. Um, so what is real time? Uh, I hear real time a lot. I hear the term for when I, my packaging, do I go order something from Amazon.com? You're getting real time update delivery. Uh, so real time video, real time clocks. Real-time uh, clocks telling you to get off the stage. Um, so you hear real-time a lot, and no one really knows what real-time is, and I hate it. It's, um, it's very ambiguous. It's used as a terminology that's used all over the place, and it's very poor terminology. But we're talking today about real-time operating system, which does have a specific connotation that we should understand, but we don't. So what is a real-time operating system? I've actually been to a customer that said, I can't wait to add you know, the real-time Linux and see how much faster our, um, our product runs. No, <laughs> it's going to run slower. <laughs> uh, I like to tell people, I, I don't like to say you know, it runs slower. Real-time Linux will give you the fastest worst-case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> so it runs faster when it's the worst thing that could happen. So what does it give us? Real-time RTOS, real-time operating system, it gives us determinism, determinism, determinism. That's what it's about. It shouldn't have been called real-time operating system. It should have been called a deterministic operating system, DOS. Which, by the way, was actually one of the best real-time operating systems they had. Because you could do anything you want. It was very deterministic when it would crash. Yes, it is. <laughs> I know people that still use DOS because of it. They have full control of the machine. Um, <clears throat> so what does deterministic mean? Well, it's got to be repeat repeatable. You'll be able to know with certain um, inputs, you're going to get a deterministic result. This every single time. Um, there's no outliers. There's no time where you're going that, you know, if these inputs happen, that you're going to get something unexpected. Unexpected means it's not deterministic. So that's what we fight against. And when you have so, like uh, input come in, you could deterministically predict when it will have an event to react on that input. That's what our toss is all about. So then we have this terminology of hard versus soft. And I hate this, because I've had wars with people. Um, <clears throat> a true hard real time that people think, this isn't what I really define, but a lot of people when they say hard real time. And this is coming back, I mean, when I was working at Lockheed Martin in the 90s, you know, we had, well, we had VxWorks and stuff like that, but, and QNX and stuff, and what we did was, um, we wrote everything so it was like mathematically computable that you could, you know, we tested every single branch, made sure uh, if it was a value we had to do, we had to do a max, min, equal, plus one, minus one. We had to hit every single boundary on every single condition. And that takes a lot of time. Um, some of our products released took 10 years of testing, quality assurance to come up with a very small application. If you modified that code, it was like another year or so before we could do anything to it because we had to test everything about it. Um, 
Some people think that's hard real time. It is. Um, soft real time is kind of like the clock. If it's off by a little bit, off by one second, you don't care. But you don't want it to be off tremendously. There's no true boundary what, how much you need this to be predictable. Well, you want it every second to be updated. That's like a soft real time system would work fine on that. Video, you drop a frame. You know, it's great. You can still see video with lots of frame loss. That's a soft real time system. You need basically, you can have outliers as long as it's limited. So the system doesn't crash on an outlier. That's basically a soft real time. So hard real time, uh, I worked on uh, playing engine controls. Uh, and uh, that was actually at General, or General Electric, uh, my first job doing unit testing. So I was one of the people that actually did the grunt work. Uh, that was my entry level job. Uh, then Lockheed, we worked on systems controls, uh, navigational units, and stuff like that. Uh, nuclear power plants, um, I worked at Siemens in Germany. That's, um, uh, they had a, their own operating system to run the nuclear power plants and other power plants. Mars lander, space shuttle, all the true mathematically, you know, lots of testing, hard real time. Soft real time, I already mentioned video games, systems, um, uh, video. Um, and other things. And actually today, because of the real-time patch, Linux is a soft real-time operating system. Most of the times, you're going, you'll have a few outliers, outliers, but most of the time you get a very deterministic result. And that was because in 2004 we started working on this project, uh, Ingo Molnar, Thomas Leichner, and others. Um, <clears throat> and real-time kept going into the Linux kernel. So, the real-time Linux preempt RT. That's what it is today. That's what we call it. And I always ask, is it a soft real-time system? Everyone's, because I've been told several times, oh yeah, you're a real-time Linux kernel. It's a soft real-time system. I'm like, no, it's not. Because we don't allow outliers. If it's an outlier, it's a bug. To me, that's not a real uh, soft real-time system. It's more than that. Um, we don't allow for any unbounded latencies. Everything has to be deterministic. But, the question is, can you, can you make Linux mathematically, can you mathematically prove that Linux is a real-time system? And to do this, it's kind of an NP-complete problem. So the more code you have, it exponentially becomes more difficult to prove it. Uh, so what I like to use the term is, real-time Linux is a um, hard real-time designed system. That means that every design decision we make in uh, our, the real-time patch is at a point where we will not allow a latency. We will not allow a uh, non-deterministic result. Everything should be able to be calculated. Uh, it would be very difficult to calculate because it's so big, but it should be possible. So all the design decisions we make is real-time. Uh, we don't allow outliers, but the thing is, there could be bugs. You know, when we talk about hard real-time, you're really talking about quality of code. Not really about the design of the code, just the quality of the code. So if Linux has no bugs in it and the real-time patch has no bugs in it, it's a hard real-time system. Like I said, it's just too damn big to mathematically prove it. Although I guess Paul McKenney is working on stuff that actually really, there's some algorithms out there to prove that we can make our latencies and pretty much prove where bugs are and not bugs, but that's whole new research projects. Paul McKenney's way up here for me, so when he talks to me, I'm like, huh? Uh, so let me go to the next one. So who uses preempt RT today? NASDAQ. I remember that was one of our customers. Um, I always laugh, but I always say auto recordings because when I'm, back in 2005, um, I got this uh, person was kept sending me bug reports. And I said, can you try this patch? And the guy's like, well, OK, but uh, how do I apply it? I'm like, well, you do patch everything. I'm like, Don't, aren't you a programmer? He's like, no, I'm not a programmer. I'm like, you're not? Then why are you using my code here? I was shocked. You know, we were a little niche, we were very unheard of, but I found out he was a musician. He was a guitar player. And he says, your product, taking Linux and applying your patch, I can record without any scratches. If there's a latency that goes on, if something happens in the background, an interrupt goes off, that sounds like a scratch in my recording. And, it, and I have to go and restart the whole thing all over again. And then I found out Jack, which is an audio tool, was 
instructing people how to download and install the preempt or the real-time patch to run all their recordings. So we had all these musicians being, they were our first test case. So I'm like, this is so cool. We're actually, someone's actually using our code besides us. Uh, I found out like TomTom Tom has it, Garmin has it. Um, so right now, basically, uh, real-time links is being used where something, you know, it's, they need real-time systems, but yet, if something goes wrong, no one can die. Um, I always tell people, you know, NASDAQ, you know, the worst thing that go wrong is you lose a billion dollars. Um, and then someone might die. So, as I mentioned before, we started out about 2004, and every year, Jonathan Corbett would pr predict, by the end of the year, real-time patch will be in the kernel. And every year he said that. And it was a joke, and he finally says, I'm not going to predict this anymore. The sad part was, he was correct. Every year, the real-time patch went into the kernel. Uh, well, here's the list, you know, high-resolution timers. That was direct result from the real-time patch. We updated the uh, kernel scheduling to be uh, better real-time capable. Uh, Preemptable RCU locks. Uh, the uh, SCED deadline was, actually, that went directly into mainline because at that time, Real time was so accepted now that we could do development directly onto the main kernel. So anytime we got new development, it stopped going through the patch. We were actually now at a level after several years, uh, Linus finally uh, let us develop onto the kernel. We didn't have to go through the real time patch. So SCED deadline was from our team to get into the kernel. Uh, same thing with um, what no hertz full. I don't know if anyone knows about that. If you do config no hertz full, you can now turn off the timer interrupt. So you, if you have a single process running in user space, the timer, it will, it will not be interrupted. It just runs without the kernel bothering at all. There's still, uh, uh, what's it called? There's still uh, administration um, counting information that needs to be done. So once a second, we still have a once a second a tick. So it's not totally off, but you're, you only get interrupted once a second, which is better than a thousand times a second that it currently does. Um, and we're, we're working, I don't know if it's getting close to getting rid of that. So soon, soon it's just like you turn on no hertz full, put a, uh, something, a single process on this um, CPU and let it rip. Uh, we have prior inheritance, few Texas, F few Texas, part of my French. Um, not many people get that. <laughs> that's an American thing. Usually I always say like, you know, F few, that's, but in America, you know, you could swear and then the response back is part of my French. I don't know if anyone knew that. Uh, LockDep. LockDep is a really important part of the kernel. And um, we used to have so many issues where we'd hit deadlocks all the time. What the real-time kernel made, or what the preempts RT patch made links into, was this super SMP box. Because spin locks became, that would usually stop all preemption from running would then become a sleepable mutex. Which means that if you, on a normal machine, uh, all these locks you have in the kernel, to simulate a race condition, you would need like maybe sometimes eight CPUs for one CPU to block on a lock, for another one to block on a lock before you triggered a bug. So since in the real-time kernel, these things that just stop the CPU from preempting to let something another task go in, the real-time kernel made it Go, made it be preemptible. So that means that if you could grab this lock, and if an interrupt goes off, it, go, it will wake up another thread, and then something else could run in its place. And then it could grab a lock, and then it would break another, another thread would wake up, or, or maybe a schedule will happen, and you have one CPU, every single thread on that kernel, or on that CPU, was like a separate CPU. So it was like a thousand CPU processor. So we were finding bugs left and right that were really crazy race conditions. I remember Andrew Morton said, what the hell? How the heck? It took like, you know, the moon had to be over here, uh, Jupiter had to be here for this bug to actually trigger. How the hell did you trigger this? Did you see, did you trigger it from, uh, or did you figure it out by just looking at it? I said, no, I could trigger it in about five minutes. I was like, how many CPUs do you have? I'm like, one. I just kick off this test, it kicks off a thousand processes, it does the thing, and bam, it locks up. And it w happened consistently. And I was able to debug it and said, here it is, here's the race condition, and fixed it. This is why in, um, this is, this was happening, like I said, 2004, 2005, 2006. And back then, 
S&P was like unheard of for most average person. Today, your phone has like three CPUs in it, four CPUs in it. Um, so when all these supercomputers started coming out, like 16, I remember it was like, first it was like four CPUs, then eight CPUs, 16 CPUs. I'm working on an 80 CPU box right now. Linux runs fine on it. And it really has to do with the real-time patch because we found all these bugs that would be triggered by a 60 CPU box. We found it when I only had one CPU on it. So that's the thing. The real-time patch has improved Linux tremendously just from its capabilities. Um, <clears throat> Lockdep, because we were getting so sick of finding these. So it was, like, was Wacomo. Someone had that. I forgot who, was, who showed the Wacomo mole. John? Yeah. You had the whack-a-mole thing, that was it. We find a bug, go on, find another one, go on, find another one. The next release come out, 12 more bugs came up. So Peter Zilstra was getting fed up with this, and he worked to write um, a lock analyzer that would look at uh, bugs, because there's some really, really crazy bugs. For example, if you have a spin lock that's taken an interrupt handler, that spin lock, um, <clears throat> but anytime you grab that spin lock anywhere, you have to disable interrupts. Makes sense, correct? That makes it so, because if you grab a spin lock, remember a spin lock in the main line uh, spins until it's released. So it blocks that CPU and it's waiting for another CPU to finish. And it's, it's, do, it's exactly what its name sound. It's spinning. It's just, well, look at a bit. Is this bit set? Once a bit clears, I'll continue. So it's spinning around uh, until another CPU. Now, if, if, this CPU, if this spin lock can be taken in an interrupt handler, and if you've got this lock and you're spinning and an interrupt goes off, and that interrupt handler goes, hey, let me grab this lock. It's now going to spin on the bit that's, or from the guy that's holding it that it just preempted. So that's a, that's a AA deadlock. Now, here's the fun thing. This is the reason why I bring this up because you have certain scenarios. You have lock A and lock B. Lock B is never taken in an interrupt handler. So you say, I don't need to grab, I don't need to disable interrupts to grab lock B. Yes, you do. Because lock B can be held by lock A that can be taken in an interrupt handler. And this is what happens. We have, you have, uh, you grab lock B, or so first, yeah, yeah, you grab lock B, and you're going on, and an interrupt goes off. On another CPU, you grab lock A, which this interrupt could use, and then you go to grab B, but it's held, so you start to spin. The interrupt goes off, goes grab lock A, it's spinning on CPU one. CPU two has, um, what's it called, lock B, which the CPU one is laying on. So even though lock B can never be taken in an interrupt handler, it still needs protection. And this could go on and on. You could have lock C that, so if lock A and lock B is done, you're fine, okay. But now you have lock C that can never be taken in an interrupt handler, but it could be held with lock B. In fact, it could go on forever. So if you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G is never taken in an interrupt at all. But lock A can be, and then you have A that could grab B, and then someplace else B could grab C, someplace else C could grab D. It goes down the chain, and just because all the way down, you could have a deadlock. To analyze this, was it was almost impossible for a human to be able to analyze all locking scenarios. It was impossible to see. So lock depth was created, and it monitored. Whenever you grab a lock, it said, am I doing, grabbing this in an interrupt handler? Am I grabbing this um, non-interrupt handler? And it did call chains for you. So it would detect that whole call chain, and if you ever called lock G down there in a non, with interrupts enabled, lock would say, hey, and blow up and give you this really nasty message. When LockDep came in, we have stopped hitting these bugs uh, if people run LockDep on their code. But a lot of people now do, and we got rid of a lot of these deadlocks that were almost impossible to find by any type of review. So what's left? The spin locks to sleeping mutexes. Um, <clears throat> as I told you, you spin. But when you spin, I hate to say this, when spin locks were made, we always saying, okay, we're only gonna hold a spin lock for a few microseconds. That's great. Well, I hate to say this, I could run a few test cases and that spin lock could be held for milliseconds. And if you need reaction times with less than a millisecond, it, um, <clears throat> you're in trouble. So. What we do is we make spin locks turn to sleeping mutexes. To do that, we have to have um, threaded interrupts, which, by the way, is in the mainline now. That's one of the things that went from RT into mainline. You can make your, all your interrupt handlers be a thread, just like every task. And I'll talk about that. Uh, we also have priori inheritance, and I'll talk a little bit about that, too. So what is latency? Um, 
Latency basically is defined, as I have written here, the time between when an event is expected to happen and when the time it actually happens. Uh, there's always latency. Uh, as what could cause latency is if you disable interrupts. Uh, how long as that interrupts are off, that CPU is basically just doing whatever it wants to do and it's ignoring everyone else. Um, okay, I told you I was in Brazil and I had a very high level people, so I'm sure everyone here knows what an interrupt is, but I'm going to discuss it just because I want to show off my artwork. Um, I drew this. <laughs> So basically, what do you have for, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I was like, I don't know about copyright laws and stuff like that, so I was afraid to take anything off the internet, so I'm like, you know what, I'll just draw my own diagrams. So you have the CPU in the middle. Um, you know, what is an interrupt? Interrupt is basically some device, you have the webcam, your hard drive, you know, um, network card, clock, timer clock, the mouse, even your mouse, your keyboard. They're all, you know, you're, every time you hit something, it sends a signal to the interrupt. There's an interrupt line. If you're hardware guys here, you know about the, which uh, pin that would be and stuff like that. And it tells the CPU to say, stop what you're doing and jump to this uh, address space and run some code over here. And that code is going to figure out, okay, it will do so, it will say, oh, who called me? What's your interrupt line? And, and depending on which architecture, there's a whole bunch of ways that can finally get down to this, this device. So it runs some code to handle the device that said, okay, you interrupted me. Why did you interrupt me? You need to, um, or I need to do something. A network card, packet came in. Oh, we're going to pull in a packet. So there's lots of reasons that have interrupts. So um, this way, interrupts. So when you disable interrupts, you get the guy that's, you know, now sleeping, listening to his iPod, and everyone else is like, they can't, he can't hear anymore. So that's what interrupts disabled is. Again, I just want to show off my artwork. Uh, so interrupt inversion uh, is a form of latency that you have to watch out. So you have a high priority task, it's running, and an interrupt comes in, and it goes and calls its handler, and the handler takes a long time, and um, this space, like, like if you, we used to have a lot of uh, the uh, hard drive, the old hard drive, spinning hard drives, they used to um, have a normal interrupt handler, and it was, used to take a long time. This is where the milliseconds went in. And Christoph Helvick, who was one of the file system guys, who always refused. We don't need threaded interrupts. We don't need threaded interrupts. And one day, I guess his customer was complaining about um, the length of time, like a lot of the uh, hard drive, when they were hitting XFS file system, uh, they were, their system was just going, slowing down tremendously. I remember one conference, Christoph comes up and he goes, Steve, when's your uh, threaded interrupts going to be uh, in the main line? <laughs> so it's like people's perception of real time um, can change when they realize how this can help uh, the kernel. And I always tell people when they want to push something into the kernel, I said you can never push something into the kernel. It must be pulled in. So you have to show, if you have an idea, you have a feature, you want to um, do something, you have to show the kernel maintainers how it benefits them. And you can. You could twist around. We, we became masters. Ingo Molnar, Thomas Gleichner, we became masters of disguise. And we would always do something, and Leo Straval has told Thomas Gleichner once, he says, I know what you're doing. <laughs> he goes, I know you're squeezing stuff in here for your real-time patch. But you guys, every time you do, the kernel gets a little bit better, so I let you. So if you could do that, you could make the kernel a little bit better, people would be much more accepting to pull in your patches and pull in your change and do your new feature. So, yeah, the high priority task is a huge thing. So what do we do? Well, the interrupt still actually happens. You know, I can't stop hardware. I can't change hardware. Real time doesn't change hardware. Um, what we do is, so you have a high priority task. The interrupt goes off. And now what we do is it says, oh, this interrupt is, there's a, there's a thread somewhere that needs to be done. So it will um, wake up that thread and continue, then go right back to the um, process that was running. So you have a... Um, the time frame of the interrupt is now much, much smaller. And that takes about one microsecond to do that. Interrupt comes in, wake up, back to the process. So it's a one micro, microsecond latency that you can't stop. And if now, if you, on this is a mainline kernel, you could enable interrupts as threads. Um, a lot of device drivers now, without even enabling the config option, a device driver can now say, request IRQ threaded where it gives you, and this is really nice because currently when you do the big hammer of like make everything threaded, we do the threading at the interrupt line, at that, um, the vector. So if you have three devices sharing that same interrupt line, when one of them sends the interrupt, we 
uh, kick, we take it, we kick off the thread, and then we, uh, uh, what's it called, disable that interrupt line. So no other device can send a new interrupt. But all the threads will be woken up, to, or actually it's one thread will woke up and go down each device that's registered on that line, say, you know, was it you that woke me up? Was it you that woke me up? Was it you that woke me up? And that isn't the best solution, but it's kind of the only solution we really have. And all real-time operating systems kind of do this. What's, but what's better is if the device itself if you say request a threaded interrupt, what that does, it gives you two handlers. And this is like we're back to top half and bottom half. And for a lot of people, I know that if you've seen the history of Linux. Uh, the top half is that little, if I go back, the top half is that first guy, the first one up here. The bottom half is the thread. So the top half, instead of disabling the interrupt line, what it does is say, disable your device. Tell your device, OK, I got your message. Don't send me anything else because I'm going to process you now. So when a device says register in IRQ threaded, the first top handler just basically says, yes, it's me, and turn them off. And then that's all it should do. And it shouldn't call spin locks, by the way, because <laughs> spin locks in real time are sleepable. So that top lat half is not sleepable. So all it should do is wake up, disable the device, and go back. And then the threaded part could do whatever it wants to grab spin locks or whatever else and do all the work. Uh, so in mainline, you could, there's a lot of devices out there today that actually just said, I want a threaded interrupt. And that way they don't really have to use, you know, worker threads and all that other thing. All they, they can if they choose to. But if you disable, but in RT, we need all interrupts. And I said we do it at the uh, inter interrupt line if the, if the device itself doesn't have it threaded. And this is where you do LS or PS um, to see all the processes. You'll see a ton of them, IRQ. And, and um, we've updated our code in the old day. In fact, I updated the slide because the original path, it just said IRQ 1, 2, 3, 4. Now we actually have information of what those interrupt threads. So, you, know, you can see the ACPI interrupt, the PCI interrupt, the uh, UACI interrupt. You know, the real-time clock interrupt, the serial interrupt, you know, I-915 interrupt, you know, all the, you, they're all now kind of labeled. So what's really nice about these, these are threads, which means you could chase a priority. You can make, now you could have your processes, any user space process can run at a higher priority than any of the um, uh, threads um, or interrupt threads. And I have full talks about do's and don'ts about real-time Linux uh, before. That's one of my talks I have. And because... Uh, when you have this power, you could really destroy your system. You could screw it up. And I'll, I'll talk about that in my next talk, too. So latency always happens. <clears throat> you can't stop it. Uh, there's, like I said, there's always going to be an interrupt that comes in. There's got to be a timer. So no perfect system. You will never have a 0% latency. I always say our goal of the real-time kernel, all real-time kernels, is to have one, like an instantaneous response time, which is just physically impossible. Uh, and whenever something is running, like if you have like that interrupt handler that came off for some device that you don't care about, in that little top level interrupt, that's called a priority inversion. I, I like to say interrupt inversion, but it's really a priority inversion because uh, <clears throat> the reason why it is is because it's something's running when something else should be instead. So you can't stop priority inversion. What we worry about is something called uh, unbounded priority inversion. And the idea is, and I love this slide, I use it in all my real-time talks. <laughs> uh, so you have three processes, A, B, and C. And <clears throat> A is a high-priority process, B is a second-priority process, and C is, let's say, sked other. It's, a, it's just um, uh, C is uh, uh, just a normal process or whatever. But for some reason, maybe it's just doing logging. You don't care about it. It's just doing logging. In fact... That's a real scenario that happened in the news a long time ago. Um, a is running, and uh, let's say C, okay, let me start back. C is running and it grabs some lock, some resource. You know, it's doing some internal work, it's, and it grabs some resource inside the kernel, grabs a lock. Uh, it gets preempted by A. A wakes up, who's very high priority process, and it runs. And now it wants to grab this, or do, hit the same resource as C has, so it grabs the same lock. Obviously, it blocks, so it goes to sleep. And C wakes up and starts to, continues to run, but B wakes up. And B wakes up and starts running constantly. And let's say B, which is higher priority than C, so it preempted it, and in doing so, it preempted A. And let's just say this. B won't stop until A tells it to. What happens? 
It's unbounded. It's, it's infinite. It's now going, B is going forever now. And the whole system crashes. This actually happened on um, the Mars lander. It was going up to space, the Mars lander, and the system locked up. Luckily, they have a lot of backup systems, and they could review what was going on. And they saw that, oh, crap, and they analyzed it. They said, oh, crap, the logging system used a resource that uh, a high-priority process needed, and it got blocked on it, and then a medium process came in and went on, and they couldn't stop it. Now, this is something that was supposed to be mathematically proved, but they just they missed this. And what the answer, what they did was they rebooted the device. device they actually rebooted it in flight and disabled logging. They just killed C. Say, C, don't you run. And then they, and it worked. <clears throat> Scary. The way we solve this is something called priority inheritance. So what priority inheritance is, is C runs, you know, it grabs lock, it grabs a lock, gets preempted by A, A runs, grabs the same lock as C, but instead of just C running at its own priority, it inherits the, inherit, uh, it, it inherits the priority of A. So it now runs. Now when B wakes up, it's of a lower priority than C because C is now running at A's priority and it doesn't do anything. There's no way, it doesn't get woken up. Well, no, it does wake up, but it doesn't run. It doesn't get scheduled. So now C releases the block, a lock and as soon as C releases a lock, it loses its priority that it inherited and A now jumps up and now A runs. And when A is done, oh, okay, C or B could continue. That's priority inheritance. And we have that today in uh, the Futex, the fast user Mutex. Um, so if you go in, in GCC, and this is another, I'm sure, man page. I don't know if it's man page. Yeah, the P, I think there's a man page for this, probably, uh, for the Mutexes. It talks about uh, the PI. Uh, you send in an attribute that says, I want a priority inheritance uh, um, uh, Mutex from the P thread Mutex. And it uses Futexes, and it uses this code in the kernel to um, do the priority inheritance within you. What we do in the preempt RT patches, we turn the, the spin locks into mutexes, and we also hook the prior inheritance mechanism into all these locks within the kernel. And it's the same code. So we got all this in the code. It came right from the patch and it was rewritten. When we submitted the priority inheritance code to the kernel for mutexes, we were expecting a fight because a lot of people told us, over our dead body will I let you know, prior inheritance ever into the kernel. I think Linus said that. Linus didn't care. I don't know, it was like, they were like we were all ready. We, had, we, we researched information. We had all this, these comebacks. We knew every line that someone's going to criticize us for. And we, we, we were ready. We were ready for that fight. And it went in. I said, thank you, guys. And we're like, <laughs> no one complained. We were waiting for that flame war to happen. And it never did. It just went right in, and it started to be used. So we're like shaking our heads. How is this possible? <clears throat> now... This is going to be like the topic of my next talk. Uh, hardware does matter. The real-time system is not just a kernel. And this is where I always get upset at people who say, hey, I'll just throw the real-time operating system onto my machine. I, gotta operate, I have a real-time environment. I'm like, no, you don't. You have a real-time kernel running something else. Or, running, uh, or you're running everything on top of a real-time system, but everything else needs to be real-time if you want real-time. Your application needs to be real-time aware. The hardware needs to be real-time aware. Everything needs to be real-time. And I'm not going to go into it now, and I'm kind of early. I kind of, I don't know if I was because I was speaking fast, although my next talk is going to probably take up time, so maybe if we, too bad I wasn't doing back-to-back, because -back, my other talk is going to be longer. Well, anyway, I guess that's just questions. <laughs> The what? The what? What is the difference of fibers, uh, resolution, and precision? But you have it, I mean, I'm kind of confused. Resolution, precision, fibers? Yes, I saw that for uh, higher resolution fibers. Yeah, well, for higher resolution fibers, this is a better precision for that. So it seems like it's the same resolution, precision, and this one is the same. Okay, wait, you know, basically, what does high resolution timers give you? Yeah, it's a precision, yeah, because, you know, okay, here's the thing. Oh, that's working. This one's working. Uh, here's the thing. <clears throat> we, 
With high resolution timers, or, or actually without high resolution timers, we have something called a timer wheel that imp is implemented in the kernel. So you could say, hey, I want to go off at, um, set up a timer. You can set up a timer or sleep or something like that and say, I want to go off in um, 12 microseconds, or say, yeah, say I want to go off in 100 microseconds. Well, if your system is set up at, as, say, um, 100 hertz, you know, what is that, 10 milliseconds? Yeah, about 10 milliseconds. Your timer will go off at 10 milliseconds. Your, your, the precision is 10 milliseconds. If you look at the timer API or the timer man page, uh, it will say that a timer will go off no earlier than when you tell it to. But there's no definition of when it will go off afterwards. So that's the precision. The precision is only you know, 10 milliseconds. So you can't say, I want to go off at um, uh, 100 mi microseconds because it's going to go off in the next 10 milliseconds. The next you say that, it's going to, the timer is going to go off in 10 milliseconds. No matter, unless, unless you're lucky that you set the timer only 100 microseconds before the next 10 millisecond time. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what it does. Now, high resolution timers doesn't do that. What it does is it, it changes, it doesn't use a timer wheel, it uses an RB tree, which is kind of a, a balanced um, binary tree. And it looks at always what's the next timer to go off at. And <clears throat> when you add something into this, it says, okay, look at the next timer and set the inner paneler to go off at that time exactly. And then it, when it takes it off, it looks at, okay, what's the next time, timer to go off at? And set to change the inner, uh, the timer, the timer to go off at the next available time. Now, this is great for a lot of things, but it sucks for other things. The timer wheel is great for timeouts. Uh, networking, uh, you should be, should use this, or yeah, all the networking code uses the timer wheel. Because the timer wheel has a O1 adding, um, um, big O1 to add and remove. It just happens that there's also the timer wheel when it goes, when it hits the way it's set up, there's times it does a cascade, which could take like a millisecond to do with interrupts disabled. So it, we don't, we've rewrote the timer wheel as well in RT. And, um, but you don't care. If it's a timeout, like if you're doing networking and, you know, a packet comes in, you say, okay, two minutes from now, if I don't get a connection, I want to kill this, uh, kill the connection. If I don't get the ACK within two minutes, so I'm going to kill the connection. And, uh, you don't care if it's two minutes or two minutes and five seconds, two minutes, three minutes. <laughs> and the thing is, since t uh, every time you send an ACK and every time you, every time you send a packet, uh, you're setting a timer. And so that's never going to go off. Or you hope it doesn't go off. If you have a good connection, these timers will never go off. So the, time, the network encodes adding and removing, you know, millions of timers. So it needs to be fast to add and remove, add and remove. Timer will, great for that. But if you're doing anything where I need a reaction time, you've got to use the high resolution timer. And there's certain codes in user space where you could pick the timer wheel and you could pick the uh, high resolution timers. I think one of the, pos the POSIX timers, I believe, uses high resolution, but some of the old time timer interfaces, like at, whatever, like if you look at that, that uses the timer wheel because it really doesn't care how exactly when that goes off at. Answer? Here. Here. <clears throat> Not a command line, but a config option within the kernel. So, um, yes, we're working on that. Maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> No, the uh, Linux Foundation actually um, has put together a group um, where they want companies. So if anyone is interested in getting real time into um, Linux, contact, well, give me, I give you contacts, uh, contact the Linux Foundation and try to get your company to help become a sponsor. And you get access to like Thomas Kleichner, who's the head uh, lead of the real time patch. And he will actually, you know, um, there's, you can actually get him to help you directly. Um, but we need uh, funding, and actually we're, we, we're getting it. It's getting there, and the goal is to get it into mainline. Now, okay, I told you that sleeping spin lock, that's the last feature we need. The problem is we change the sleeping spin lock. I go into details, so I got 40 seconds, I can't go into full details, but um, the sleeping spin lock causes, changes the paradigm of the kernel. And there's a lot of places in the kernel that break because of that, just little tiny things. So we have to go in 
if you look at the patch today, there's about 300 patches inside the preempt RT tree. And most of those are tweaks, workarounds, hacks to fix the kernel. Um, but they're not appropriate for mainline. They're not good enough. We would be ashamed to post that to the mainline list and say, hey, guys, accept that. So we're working with upstream maintainers where we're putting hacks in. And a lot of this code ne requires a redesign of the code. Dput needs to be redesigned. OK, that's, and that's a huge taking. Um, right now, Thomas Gleisner is working on CPU hot plug. It needs to be redesigned, completely redesigned, rewritten. Uh, there's a lot of areas of the kernel that just is a mess. It needs to be rewritten to become better. We've done it before. We've, uh, Thomas worked on uh, generic um, interrupt handlers. Every, every arc had a different implementation of how to do interrupts. It was basically a cut and paste from, they took x86, cut and pasted it to their arc, and then just started hammering at it. Thomas went there and got rid of all that and made, here's one code, and now it's in the kernel, in the kernel directory tree for IRQ management. And you could do all your code, and, and the arcs only have very, very specific, or they could register, okay, I need this feature, I need this feature, this feature. So everything's in one place. And that came from the RT tree because to do real time, we had to have control of the um, interrupt handlers. And it was becoming a pain to write the same code for every single arc. Now we only do it in one place. Anyone else? <clears throat> so, was that a good level then, I would say, but, uh, in technical topic? Good, because next time I'm going lower. Thank you. <laughs>